X-Men Days of Future Past rebooted the X-Men cinematic universe and sets a new course for the film series that began with X-Men First Class. But it bears only a passing resemblance to the Days of Future Past saga from Uncanny X-Men number 141 and 142, the comic books on which the movie is based. Yes, it's about sending an X-Man back in time to stop Mystique from assassinating a political figure, thus rewriting the future. But there are several changes that have occurred in translation, not the least of which is the story's main character. You guys kept asking for it, so we figured we'd jump back in time to try and find as many differences as we could between the comic and the movie. I'm Michael Truly, and I'm Casey Redman, so without further ado and no restraint on spoilers, uh, what's the difference? In late 1980, X-Men's Chris Claremont and John Byrne introduced a terrifying new nemesis for the mutants to combat. Their own future. Oh, Byrne! For almost 20 years, the comics had explored the theme of humans' hatred and fear of the mutants, highlighting the X-Men's valiant battle for acceptance and equality. Claremont and Byrne shocked readers with the worst-case scenario, the utter failure of everything the X-Men had been trying to accomplish. One of the biggest differences between the comic and the film is how this future is portrayed. In the original Days of Future Past storyline, the dystopian future filled with killer mutant hunting robots is in the year 2013. But since the film came out in 2011, the future is set in 2023. In the film's future, the Sentinels have taken over the entire world already. While in the comics, they've only taken control of North America. And now they look to expand in order to save the rest of the world from the mutant threat. But the rest of the world threatens to nuke the hell out of North America and anywhere else in order to stop the Sentinels' plans, thus leading to nuclear Armageddon and the end of everything as we know it. The film provides a hint of the delineations that Sentinels give people when we see the M's seared into the faces of the mutant prisoners. In the comics, the letters are sewn into their prison uniforms with three designations given out to everyone. H for human, A for anomalous humans who could produce mutant children, and M for mutant. The film also gives us a glimpse of the power eliminating techno neck braces which kick off the two-phase scheme our future mutants devise in order to change the past. This jammer should neutralize our inhibitors. Since the comic universe exists in a larger Marvel universe where non-mutant heroes also exist, like the Hulk who has his own Days of Future mini comic prequel thing, they also clarify that all powered folks got classified into the mutant pool. In the film, the Sentinels are on an extermination style warpath. Exterminate! Killing every mutant they can find. There is the suggestion of concentration camps for mutants at the very beginning, but we never really see the Sentinels capture anyone. They only seem interested in killing. You know, like that guy. And that other guy. And oh, that lady, she needs to die. Oh, and that dude, don't miss that guy. The Sentinels from the comics seem to prioritize capture and only destroy when met with extreme resistance. Both start off with Kitty Pride, though in the film, she's saving a group of remaining X-Men from impending robo-death through some mind-melding, timey-wimey traveler shit. While in the other, she's looking for Wolverine to help break the remaining X-Men out of the concentration camp while she sends her consciousness into her younger self. It's hot, I'm not gonna lie. So this leads us to playing Who's Still Breathing? In the film, it's kind of a lot of people, given the fact that half of everyone died in The Last Stand. Blech. Gross. In fact, Charles Xavier died in The Last Stand. Blech. Gross. Anyway, in the film, the mutants running from the Sentinels include Kitty Pride, Storm, Iceman, Bishop, Colossus, Blink, Sunspot, Warpath, Magneto, Professor X, Wolverine, and if you count the deleted scene, Rouge. Sorry, I read that wrong. Rogue. In the comics, most people are dead, and unlike the film, we don't start out by seeing them butchered, just by seeing a number of graves. You got Johnny Storm, Ben Grimm, Susan Richards, Scott Summers, Reed Richards, Lorna... Uh, a, a bunch of people die. Despite being an X-Men story, they very much address the fact that yes, we are still in the Marvel Universe. Later established as dead were Captain America, Scarlet Witch, Hulk, Black Panther, Vision, Iron Man, Daredevil, and Ghost Rider. The remaining survivors include Kitty Pride, now all grown up and going by Kate Pride, Storm, Colossus, to which Kitty Pride is married to, by the way, Rachel Summers, yet you guessed it, Cyclops and Jean's daughter, Franklin Richards, who is Fantastic Four's Reed and Susan's kid. Oh, and both of those kids are fornicating, by the way. You got Wolverine and Magneto, in a wheelchair no less. Everyone else is implied to either be dead or imprisoned. One exclusion from the film that fans have vocalized as a missed opportunity is Franklin Richards, the future adult version of the child character from present day. Franklin was a background character and cannon fodder in the days of future past, most notable as the boyfriend to Rachel Summers and for dying at the hands of a sentinel attack a little more than halfway through the story. 
The comic also features the rogues, racist humans who dress like the warriors and apparently blame mutants for the state of the world, because they lay traps for them and allude to torture. By the way, this whole story takes place in a mutant housing project guarded by sentinels, rather than on the run like in the movie. So back to the main story. The remaining group of mutants wants to send someone's mind into the past to stop a political assassination by Mystique in order to rewrite the future. That part is still the same, but leads us to the other major difference that everyone loves to talk about. Who goes into the past? Instead of Kitty going back, the task is given to Wolverine on film. Obviously, the decision was made based on box office appeal. Hugh Jackman, who plays the mutant we love to love, is a proven success, as is the character who got himself two standalone movies. But it's not just about star power. At the time of Days of Future Past, Kitty, who was introduced in issue 129, was relatively new to the X-Men, and even vanished for several issues when the plot diverted towards the Phoenix Saga. But it was clear that Kitty was shy and scared, and only in Days of Future Past, when we meet her future self, Kate, do we get to meet the superhero that she was meant to be. Meanwhile, Wolverine already was that superhero, and as a man with a long lifespan, he's already an adult in the past. If you think about the trials and tribulations of a 13-year-old girl trying to convince the X-Men of her veracity, it slows down the plot. Wolverine can and does hit the ground running. Not that he doesn't stumble, being persuasive isn't exactly Wolverine's strong suit, and the film takes full dramatic advantage. Although it would have been wonderful to see Kitty turn from timid to capable in an instant, and Ellen Page absolutely has the chops to pull it off, this isn't that movie. He's well not. The comic book saw the present action taking place in the early 80s, the time of its current comics. The film gives us a much wider range of time. The movie's future is set in 2023, and the past doesn't take place in our present after X-Men The Last Stand. If it did, Kitty could presumably have hopped back into her body from that movie. Rather, it takes place in 1973, about 10 years after the events of X-Men First Class, to which this film is nominally a sequel. Because the X-Men are disbanded, Professor Xavier is despondent, and Kitty Pride isn't even conceived yet. Hell, her parents probably weren't even sexually active at this point, but, you know, I invite any sort of proof to the contrary. When Kitty Pride travels into the past, she enters her body while it's still conscious, and her younger self passes out as a result. Since this happens in front of everyone, there's an immediate jarring effect because she has to explain her mission to the team who are wondering what happened to her upon waking up. It was useful to have this rip the band-aid off device, because for her to have to sell people on her story over and over again as Wolverine did, would have felt like wasted pages that the creators didn't really have. With most of the first class characters dead, the only people that remain to travel back, essentially, are Magneto, Professor X, or Wolverine. Because there just aren't that many mutants over 50 still alive when we begin our story in the dystopian future. Hey kid. The changes made to Xavier's character necessitated someone being sent back who could help him through his issues. Magneto was in prison, so that left but one choice. No! As a side note, sending Wolverine back did take away the possibility to see him die in the iconic way that he does in the comics, where a sentinel incinerates him until nothing but his adamantium skeleton remains. Damn, that would have been cool. Okay, so in the comics, Rachel sends Kitty back into her younger body. In the movie, Kitty sends Wolverine back into his younger body. The dates are all different, the futures are different, but then everything is the same once that happens, right? Right? Well, no. In the comics, the victim of the assassination plot isn't Trask at all, but Senator Kelly. Given that Kelly isn't a senator until the first X-Men film, which is a good 30 years or so in the future, Bolivar Trask and his program got the starring Death Note. That being said, in the comics, it's not just the senator that Mystique offs, but also Charles Xavier and Moira McTaggart. They all die at the same time. The filmmaker's choice to keep Xavier alive implies that even with the professor doing his thing, they can never truly win over the public and are doomed to failure. This more or less makes Magneto right. Let them pass that law and they'll have you in chains with a number burned into your forehead. The assassination plot doesn't exclusively involve Mystique in the comics, like it is in the movie, although she's the leader and mastermind of the whole plot. In fact, it's the then-current iteration of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, including Destiny, Avalanche, Pyro, and The Blob. Mystique as the leader is a nice look on her, considering how she spent most of the First Class and Days of Future Past movies oscillating between letting Xavier and Magneto make important decisions for her and then resenting them for it. There's a brief indication of this leadership and team-building post-Magneto stuff in the film when she saves Toad, Ink, Havoc, and that weird Quill Kid Omega hybrid mutant in Saigon and throws out a line that Magneto isn't in charge anymore. I'm on my own now. 
but those kids disappear and don't help with the main plot like her cronies do in the comics. The X-Men posse is also different. Given that the Phoenix Saga just happened, Scott Summers has taken a leave of absence, and so this is Storm's first time heading the team as the leader. Under her guidance are Colossus, Wolverine, Nightcrawler, and Angel. Lots of people wanted Alan Cumming to come back, but of course it would have been difficult to do since he was not a first-class X-Man, but a singer generation X-Man. But in the Munich Circus, I was known as the Incredible Nightcrawler. Yes, save it. In the film, Wolverine has Professor X, Magneto, and Beast. We're not quite sure why he doesn't still have Quicksilver, since he's the coolest character in the film, but eh, whatever. Side note, Quicksilver makes no appearance at all in the comic. So in the film, Wolverine convinces Emo Charles to get on board, frees Magneto, brings along Beast, and they stop Mystique. This starts a whole plot line about Trask using her blood to evolve Sentinels, and mutants get outed to the public, none of which takes place in the comics. Kitty convinces the team to intervene, and they fly over to the Senate hearing and engage in a massive destructive battle, not unlike the movie, although it's ultimately more controllable in the comics, and there's no Magneto there to rant and pontificate and drop buildings and all that stuff. We also get Mystique impersonating Nightcrawler and a play on the I'm your mother getaway gambit that she used on Rogue in the animated series. How could you do that to me, Mama? But unlike cartoon Rogue, Nightcrawler regroups and is ready to apprehend her until she shapeshifts into hiding like in the movie. Kitty plays a key role in stopping Destiny from assassinating Kelly, which even when you ignore the fact that Destiny has never existed in the films, remains a significant change since leaving the decision to pull the trigger or not up to Mystique's own judgment was a major thematic beat in the film. Then the comic ends. Yeah, they stop the assassination attempt, Kate's mind goes back into the future, and the X-Men are left with an only time will tell what happens ending. There's the foreshadowing of things still going all sentinel, with Sebastian Shaw showing up at the White House, but that's it. The rest of the plot, including the second assassination attempt, and all the Charles Magneto Raven three-way drama, Logan drowning, Nixon temporarily being down with mutants, and the future being saved, all of that was written for the film. The next comic sees Kitty Pride face off against a xenomorph-like demon, and the Days of Future Past timeline isn't revisited until Days of Future Present, almost 10 years after the two-issue story was released. Franklin Richards comes back, even though he's dead, and Rachel Summers lives in the past as Phoenix, but she doesn't know who she is. And the Fantastic Four team up the X-Factor, who are Cyclops, Jean Grey, Archangel, Iceman, and Beast, the new mutants, Sunspot, Warlock, Boom Boom, Richter, Wolfsbane, Cannonball, and their leader Cable are being hunted by Ahab, who turns people into his personal pet hounds. Franklin turns out to be just some sort of dream projection, and then he alters everyone, goes into the future, saves it because it's ultimately an alternate timeline and a multiverse, and it's so confusing, and red is blue, up is down makes no sense and my brain hurts <sighs> so yeah ultimately the biggest difference of all is the conception of time itself too late assholes Kitty does not stop the future from happening, because the Marvel Universe is a multiverse, and the future she comes from is not the future she created by changing the past. Therefore, the past that she came to, our present, will not end up where her future did. Yeah, her future remains unchanged, because if something isn't, it can never be, because the thing that is, was, and then, uh, time. In the film, though, there is one timeline. Therefore, by changing the past, they do change the future. 15 years into this franchise, there have been as many bad movies as good, and even the good ones were sometimes a black hole of continuity. That's nothing new for the X-Men, of course, but it's not something you want in your mainstream blockbuster popcorn franchise. In this movie, they were able to clean it up a lot, and arguably, most important, jettison some of the bad movies and establish that the future is wide open for the characters. Nothing but smooth sailing, all the X-Men are gonna get on their horses and ride off into their sunset and jump those horses into a white Camaro and drive through Florida to spring break. The touching postscript of salvation in the film didn't happen at all in the comics, which is probably just as well, since that kind of massive overhaul of the timeline done in the film wouldn't have worked within Marvel's multiverse time travel structure. Anyway, that's all for now. I bet you either want to pop in the movie or get around to finally reading the comic or getting high and just thinking about like the void and time and how like your present self is actually your past self. Who knows? Like this video if you want to see more of What's the Difference. Make sure to subscribe to Cinefix for more awesome movie content and let us know in the comments what you thought of all the changes. See you next time.